Hi, I'm Susan Weisbauer, co-author of The Well-Trained Mind. And I'm Susanna Jarrett, editor at The Well-Trained Mind Press. And we're talking about education for all parents and for all children in all sorts of settings. So, Susanna, last week we talked about what classical education is. And if you're listening to this podcast and you haven't heard that one, I'm always a fan of giving positive definitions before we start talking about negatives. And what we're going to do today is talk about what classical education isn't. So if you haven't heard that episode yet, the What Classical Education Is one, might be a great idea for you to go back and listen to it before you come back to this one, because today is all about the negatives. And I would like to say that saying what something isn't is a really important part of definition. Um, So for you real classical geeks in rhetoric, Aristotle talks about the value of a negative in drawing a picture of what we're really trying to make a portrait of, the negative space, as it were, something you definitely learn in art, but then also in rhetoric. So in this case, we're talking about classical education. And I feel like there are a lot of ideas floating around out there about what classical education um, has to be. And I think most of those are are just not quite right. So um, if we talk about them, I think we can get a clearer picture of what classical education does have to include. So we're going to use a negative to reinforce our positive, if that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. And also along the way, be debunking some stereotypes you might have heard about classical education uh, from being in the homeschool universe. Yes, indeed. The homeschool universe, that strange, strange (laughs) realm where ideas float past you. Okay, Um, so I'm going to start with sort of one of the one of the oldest what I would call fallacies or negatives. And that is that a classical education has to be Latin centered. In fact, there was an Mm. actual program floating around out there for a while called the Latin centered curriculum, where the idea was you just center everything around Latin. That becomes the core of your classical homeschool. And then everything else sort of orbits it like planets around the sun. In case you're wondering, we watched Galaxy Quest a couple nights ago. So I have all of these like space metaphors. I have a feeling that will reappear. (laughs) Yes. The Galaxy Quest metaphors will be a recurring theme. (laughs) Yes, they may indeed. If you haven't seen it, go see it. It's a great movie. Okay. So classical education is not necessarily Latin centered. Latin is great. I took years and years of Latin. I loved Latin. Susanna, did you ever take Latin? I did not. My brothers did. I did not. So I was, I've always been skeptical of Latin as being part of a classical education only because I didn't get it. So it's like nice to be able to say, well, you don't need it. But now I'm starting to see the (laughs) benefits of it looking back at my own attempts to learn languages. Well, sure. And, and, And Latin is great. I mean, I love Latin. I found Latin to be incredibly useful. It improved my vocabulary. It improved my grammar. It improved my ability to guess the meaning of words that I didn't know, which was great when I took my SATs. I made all four of my children study Latin and to a child, they hated it. I was completely Mm. unable to convey the joy of this language to them. So I think it's really important to recognize that classical education is about an entire tradition that is thousands of years old and incorporates the entire world. And, oh, don't forget about Greek, not just Roman culture. And somehow, because we received classical education sort of through the medium of medieval and Renaissance learning, um, and the medieval and Renaissance European cultures were heirs of the Roman Empire, not directly of the Greek Empire, Latin became elevated to the Mm. classical language, right? The truth is, even if we're just going to talk about um, ancient languages, Latin if you're going to do ancient literature, is much inferior to Greek. I mean, Mm. ask any classics scholar whether the Odyssey is better than the Aeneid, Mm. which is, you know, the big Latin epic. And they'll say, oh, yeah, no, the Odyssey. The Odyssey is it. So, you know, this the focus on Latin is not actually classical. It's sort of medieval and Renaissance because it was the language of the church. And as we talked in our last episode The cathedral schools in the Mm -hmm. Middle Ages and the Renaissance were really responsible for resurrecting this mode. So Latin has a lot more to do with church culture than it does with classical culture. Oh, that's interesting. Which should 
be surprising, I think, to a lot of people who maybe are doing classical education because they want to be secular. It's something to think about. Right. And yeah. there's other languages as well. I know we talked about this before, uh, how, you know, if your goal is for your children to engage with classical texts or for the, the Quran, for example, it might make more sense for them to study classical Arabic or uh, if they're getting into the Torah, you know, Hebrew or even mm-hmm. Sanskrit, depending, but it doesn't have to be Latin. But these right. languages do allow you to engage with these ancient texts that have become a huge part of our cultural traditions. Yes, that's absolutely right. So so I think we have to back away from this and think about the principle that's behind it. And mm. I love David Hicks. Uh, he's got a wonderful book called Norms and Nobility, which is about the goals of classical education. And one of the things that he brings out so clearly is that classical education means that you are developing the ability to think and read in someone else's language uh, because that gives you a window into a world that is not your own comfortable insular culture. Mm. The value here is to be able to see from another perspective. Uh, what I always tell parents who say, you know what, um, my my relatives all speak Spanish, and so I'd really like to study Spanish, but we're doing classical education, so we have to study Latin, is what's important is that you enter into another culture and learn mm-hmm. how to learn how to understand it, because that makes you a better person. It makes you a more sensitive person. It makes you more perceptive about your own culture to live in someone else's for a little while. So... I always tell parents, if you don't have someone around you who speaks a foreign language fluently, Latin or Greek or another ancient language is great because you can learn to read it and get Mm -hmm. a lot of those benefits. Because if you don't, if you're not around native speakers, you're not going to learn how to speak a language. But if you have the ability to immerse your child in a living culture with another language, grab that and run with it. And yes, you are still doing classical education. Right. That is such a compelling principle behind learning these languages. Because when I I looked it up before, I would see things like, well, your kids have to learn Latin because uh, they might miss a reference to Julius Caesar in a pop culture or literature context. And that didn't compel, like uh, learn a whole language. So I don't miss, you know, a pop culture reference, but that really digging in and, and learning to think from another perspective is so compelling. And also, like you just mentioned, it can be a springboard if you don't have the luxury of native speakers around you. I remember my brother who did learn Latin and he also studied Italian afterwards and a bit of Spanish one day picked up this picture book in French and he just started reading it and he hadn't ever studied French but he had done enough languages that it was easier to pick things up along the way and so looking back at my language learning experience I think I would have really benefited from some basics in Latin at a young age had that been part of my education. Absolutely. And if, you know, if you can, if you can fit it into your schedule, then go Mm -hmm. for it. But I I find far too many parents who either have elementary students and they're like, well, we're doing math, we're doing writing, Mm -hmm. we're doing reading, we're doing history, we're doing all of this. I know we have to do Latin, but I just don't know where to put it in. And I say, stop, (laughs) get those basics down. That's grammar stage. Or they are parents of middle schoolers and they say, my kid hates Latin, but we're doing it darn it, Mm, because it's classical education. And I want to say, stop there. (laughs) It's really important that you give kids a reason for what they're learning. And if they want to learn another language, drop the Latin, go for it. That's awesome. Yeah. My mom, that's what happened with her. It was Latin was great while she had two kids. And then when there was the third kid and a fourth kid and a fifth, sixth and seventh, it kind of had to drop away. But that's fine. We all turned out great. I do have one question about Latin, though, because this is a homeschool, maybe one common homeschool giveaway as an adult is I know lots of words, but I don't know how to pronounce them. Uh Would learning Latin have helped me with that? (laughs) No, no. Okay, great. (laughs) Because in in English, the words that that are pronounced weirdly are mostly French inflected. Right. Okay. Or or Spanish inflected or come from some other European language uh, that isn't Latin. And so the reason why they don't quite follow, basically the rules of pronunciation in Latin and the rules of pronunciation in English are pretty much the same. Okay. So it would help it would help you know what the word meant. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't help you with the pronunciation. And uh, I, I join you. I, I feel the pain of having all my life mispronounced words that I have read but never heard. And then people laugh at me. So right. I know that pain oh, well. very well. There you go. That's what comes of being a big reader. Okay. Uh, let me just say one more thing about language learning, and then we should probably move on. Our language learning 
in the U.S., particularly for high school, is just appalling. Yeah. Usually you do you study two years of a language to fill out your transcript and get into college. And that is enough so that you can read it in translation with a dictionary. <laughs> you know, you don't learn to think in the language. You don't learn to speak it. You're so far away from that goal of moving into another culture. So I really think the central principle here ought to be whatever language you choose, stick with it long enough to develop that fluency and don't fall into the two years and we're done trap. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And it it did always confuse me that we start language learning so late in American education typically because little kids can pick up so much. And if they start in kindergarten learning a second language and go all the way through, that's going to benefit them so much more than, like you said, two years in high school. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, So Susanna, would you like to introduce our second negative? So our second negative is that classical education is not just for the super academic. Amen. Growing up, the stereotype that I had of classical homeschoolers were that they were these sort of quasi humans whose third graders were translating Caesar from the original Latin and whose 18 year olds were graduating as doctors and that they were just really strict and really intense. And that was that was for other people. It wasn't for me. But classical education education is really all about aligning learning with your child's stages of development to make sure that they're not being forced to do things that they're not developmentally ready for. So grammar Mm -hmm. stage students who are younger are naturally going to enjoy memorizing raw information without worrying too much about whether or not it's true. Whereas older students in the logic stage, they want to question things. They want to know why they want to find connections. And so you're aligning your child's education with their natural growth and development. This is for all kids. So So to use the public school terminology for a second, this is for exceptional students, for gifted students, twice gifted students, students with learning disabilities. We can all benefit from a classical education. Yes. And and I really love what you say there about ensuring that students aren't being forced to do Mm. things that they're not ready for. The thing that I love about this pattern of classical education that we discussed last week, the grammar and the logic and the rhetoric, is that the stages are not really age bound. Mm. Some kids are ready ready to move on into the logic stage when they're in second or third grade. They're on a different chronological path. And I always feel we use the term gifted for those kids. I always feel that that's a little unfair Mm -hmm. because all children go through these stages. They just do it on their own individual chronology. It's like physical growth. You know, those of you particularly who are parents of boys, you might have a boy who at eight years old is, you know, almost six feet tall. Mm-hmm. Or you might have a little boy who's still five foot four when he's 12 and then grows six inches in college. That was actually my brother's experience. Um, my mother bought him his first suit when he went to college. And by the end of college, you know, he looked like a scarecrow when he oh, put it wow. on. He, he grew so much. Yeah. He was just on a different chronological path uh, physically. So classical education, when you say it supports all students, mm-hmm. the goal of the stages is never to restrict students. It's to protect them. When they're ready to move from grammar into the logic stage, that's when you do it. If they have a processing challenge, if they have some sort of learning challenge, they're going to stay in the grammar stage longer while their brains are working out the connections. If they are, you know, quote unquote, gifted and they're ready to move into the logic stage sooner, then that's great. But they don't have to. And so we don't want to frustrate them. And it's super important to realize that kids can be, quote unquote, gifted in one area, but be on a completely different chronological path in another area. Typically, when we see this, and sometimes we call these um, like twice exceptional kids that really excel in one area, but struggle in another. Mm -hmm. Typically, one of those areas is maths related and the other is word related. One part of the brain is just on a different developmental path than the other. And what classical education allows you to do is to sit your third grader down, look at them and think, okay, you're ready to do pre-algebra, but you still can't read. Mm -hmm. That's fine. You're moving into the rhetoric stage in math and you're going to be in the grammar stage in reading and literature for quite a while. And that 
is fine. That's awesome. So it's flexible with students. And I think we're going to get into this even more in the next negative, but it works with students. It remind what you just said reminded me of this book I read when I was a kid called Understood Betsy, where she goes to this one room school and all of a sudden she's in third grade for math, but she's in fifth grade for reading or all of her grade level. She's in like four grade levels at the same time. And that's one of the wonderful flexibilities of homeschooling or wherever you are being able to allow your students to excel and move at the pace that they need to be at. Yeah. Yes. And and I think we're going to talk about this probably again, but to, to back to your original misapprehension that classical education is for the super academic, it's really important that we don't confuse classical with college bound. Some kids are going to need college and some are not. And we are so definitely going to do a long podcast about college and how to think about it. That is that sounds <laughs> great. I have so many things to say. Um, but, you know, for our purposes here, just remember that classical education is about learning how to think. And we all have to know how to think. Right. No matter what profession we're going to pursue, what calling we're going to fulfill and whether or not that calling needs a piece of paper that says you finished, you know your college education, we all need to know how to think. So classical can be academic. Classical education can also be much more hands-on. Mm. It can be much more experiential. It can be much more flexible. You don't have to have a competitive high school transcript in order to be a classical educator. That's a great point because then it it serves the end goals for all these different students. And one of the things I've noticed is that in the last maybe – 10 years, maybe less, um, the push for every student to go to college has lessened. And the idea that, you know, some kids are going to be better off going to trade school or going, you know, doing different things um, has become more widely accepted and classical education aligns with that. So that's wonderful. Yes, it does. It does. Classical education is not about the high school transcript. It's about learning to think, learning to be human. Awesome. I ref- I refer you back to the last episode. Yes. So I would say that my next important negative is that classical education is not curriculum dependent, by which I mean there is not the way. The well-trained mind isn't the only way. I, there are a lot of things that we suggest in the well-trained mind. I would say probably one of the most distinctive things about the well-trained mind pattern is the four-year history cycle. You, you know, so you do ancients. Medieval, Renaissance, early modern and modern. Guess what? You can do a six year cycle. You could do a three year cycle. You could do two years of world history and one year of American history. It doesn't matter as long as you're sort of holding to these principles of moving chronologically through history and getting a sense of the flow of the human story. There is more than one way to teach history. There is more than one way to divide up the grammar, logic, and rhetoric stages. Uh, For practical reasons, Mm. a lot of classical schools will put sort of K1 or K through 2 in sort of more of a preschool sort of thing. And then they'll do grammar for 3 through 5, logic 6 through 8, or 6 through 9. There's any number of ways that you can bring these principles in. The problem is that those of us who write about education, we're rhetoricians. (laughs) <laughs> We're very persuasive. Mm-hmm. We can make we can make a great case for why you should do it our way. Right. But as a parent, you've got to take that and think, okay, interesting. Does that work for me? So the well-trained mind is not the only way. Yeah. Classical conversations is not the way. Right. So I think people can get caught up with this, like you said. These are written by classical educators. <laughs> They're well marketed. Um, yes. And because they're well marketed, you mentioned classical conversations. It is a huge group that a lot of families use and benefit from, but it is not the way you wouldn't even say to use your own book, Well Trained Mind, by the letter or by the page. All of these things, I think we can get caught in a trap where there's a system, it sounds really good on paper, and we then try to take our children and shape them and stretch them to try to fit this system or this curriculum. Meanwhile, classical education is really meant to be shaped and stretched to fit your child. So allowing the principles to follow your family and your child is so much more effective than trying to force your children to fit one particular method. Absolutely. And if you are, I mean, these are things I tell parents all the time. First of all, I will say here at The Well-Trained Mind, 
we we sort of have two missions mm-hmm. that sometimes collide with each other. Although you know we, we we're always trying to resolve that. Look, we're a publishing company. This is how we make our living. We believe in the things that we publish. We think they are super high quality. We're proud of them, and we want everybody to use them. But the other part of our mission is to make sure that kids are thriving. Right. So we also often tell parents actually don't use our book, don't use our grammar program, don't use that writing program because your child is not going to prosper if you use that. I'll give you an example. We have um, Writing with Skill, which is our middle grade writing curriculum, which teaches expository writing. I'm super proud of this. Um, And the reason I wrote it was because I came to understand how much some kids need step-by-step nuts and bolts instruction in writing and will not thrive if you go on the inspirational model of saying, come up with a great idea and say Mm -hmm. whatever you want to about it. Their brains just don't work that way. So I call it my engineer's guide to writing. I like that. (laughs) Yeah. And it's great for those kids that need Mm -hmm. that really um, scaffolded approach to writing. I can't tell you how many parents have said to me, look, I tried writing with skill. My kid goes off and writes novels in her spare time. And every time I get writing with skill out, she cries. And I'm like, stop it. Right. (laughs) Do not use my program. Throw the book away. Go talk to Julie Bogart over at Brave Writer. You Mm -hmm. know, you need another approach here. Um, So... Even my own books, I often tell people not to use because they don't fit the kid. Right, right. The best book for one kid isn't the best, necessarily the best book for the next kid that comes along. Yes. And I don't know if I can give a teaser to our upcoming reading program, but that's another example. We Mm -hmm. have right now the Ordinary Parents Guide to Teaching Reading, which is a great program that is again, very step-by-step, has a lot of repetition, works, has worked really well for many years for many families, but we recognize that it doesn't fit the needs of every student. And so now we're creating another program. So it will be one curriculum company with two different reading programs. And it goes into this idea that there's no one program, there's no one size fits all in education. Yeah. And, you know, I do talk to and I think I think parents tend to get a little better at this as time goes on and they've been doing it longer and they get a little you know, a few years under their belt, a little bit of confidence. They see that their kid is thriving. But particularly when they start out, I meet a lot of parents who are, you know, using a particular program or they're in a particular co-op and it, they're really not enjoying it. Mm-hmm. It's not working for them, but they feel guilty about pulling the plug because they've been told this is the way to do classical education or everybody else around them is doing it and and they you know they feel like they must be getting something wrong eh, you got to go with your gut right you know if it's not working for you just remember classical education is not curriculum dependent right so i i want to uh, i want to end up with i guess what is at the moment <laughs> my most pressing isn't and that is this classical Education isn't safe. I have become increasingly aware of the number of parents who turn to classical education because they're equating classical with the past and the past with things that are safe and won't disturb or alarm or challenge my child's beliefs. Mm. And um, this is I, I know we're going to we're going to talk in a minute about a couple of examples of this, but this is often a reason why people homeschool. Right. Because they want to keep their kids safe. They want to protect them from outside influences. And listen, I get that. I was not about to put my five year old on the bus, you know, to the public school down the road because I didn't think that was safe right. for many reasons. Lack of seat belts being only one of them. <laughs> right. right. You know, I just wasn't going to do that. I wanted to protect my child. And that's fine. But we are seeing classical sort of equated with things that things that are not going to make us nervous, upset or disturbed. And we see this also, I think, in classical schools and I think particularly in Christian classical schools where parents put the kids in with the assumption of, OK, this is going to be a safe place. They're going to come back believing exactly what they believed when they left in the morning. Eh, classical education is about grappling with ideas you know, not just the ones you agree with, but the ones that you don't. And even the ones that have the potential of blowing up your worldview and forcing you to reestablish 
something different. And Susanna, I think you have some experience with this. Yeah, yeah. My parents, um, they used a lot of classical education ideas, even though they didn't call it that. And they homeschooled us all the way from kindergarten through 12th grade, me and my six siblings. Um, And their goal in that there was a desire that was probably the main reason why they homeschooled to protect us from the world, especially in elementary school and middle school, where we basically learned about the world from within their worldview. They were and are very devout Christians, and they raised us to be the same way. But at the same time, especially as we got into middle school and especially high school, they didn't shy away from exposing us to all kinds of ideas. Um, they, they knew that inevitably we were going to go out in the world and we were going to be exposed to these ideas. We were going to go to college. We were going to go become adults and they didn't want us to be surprised by anything. So they had us read the source material for major historic interpretations and scientific interpretations. I remember having to read Darwin's The Origin of the Species, which is not a thrilling read. Um, It's so not. (laughs) um, But we read that. We read the best arguments for evolution, the best arguments against it available at the time. And by the time we went to college, we knew what we believed. We knew why we believed them and could go into college and really enjoy continuing to grapple with ideas, even with our professors. I remember my professor being like shocked when I was trying to compare new historical lenses with the nature of scientific revolutions and paradigms from Thomas Kuhn. And I'm sure I was pronouncing everything wrong, but I was still (laughs) using the ideas. And they were like, where did this person come from? But high schoolers really can do this. We have to believe in our high schoolers that they can engage with the source material and engage with these ideas that are not safe, that aren't necessarily within our worldview, but allows them to grow and, and really believe what they believe for themselves and know why they believe it. Yeah. Yeah. And you know that that's such that's such a contrast to so many of the stories that I hear from classical educators. So um, you know, very uh, recently there was a quite notorious happening where a classical school principal was actually fired for showing middle school students a naked statue of the of Michelangelo's the David. Um now, I will say, you know, as a as a classical thinker, I'm sure there's I'm sure there were other issues going on there that we don't necessarily have the whole story. Right. But the representative of the board who gave interviews to the press said the problem was that the principal showed a naked picture to middle schoolers of the David and didn't check with parents first to make sure that it was okay. Mm. And that to me is just a prime example of what what do you think safe is? Right. You know, what do you think the classical what do you think classical education is for? If your idea of classical education is a, you know, 12 years during which students are never going to talk, think or learn about human bodies. Yikes. Um, or let's just take that a little further. Talk, think or learn about sex. I mean, have you read classical literature ever? Everybody's having sex all the time. Right. Uh, you know, and I would argue that a middle schooler who has never seen a naked male figure um, is possibly missing some important aspects of life. Okay, not a second grader, sure, but we were here talking about seventh and eighth graders. Right. So that to me just was was sort of emblematic of this attitude of I'm sending my child to a classical school, and so I don't have to worry about anything that they're going to see or hear because none of it is going to be disturbing, and we just cannot approach classical education in this way. Right. Yeah. I I think it's so important that we that we choose to prepare our students to go into the world, not necessarily protect them. And there's a there's something that happens somewhere, maybe it's in middle school, that transition from protecting to preparing because they're not going to yes. be in our households forever. They need to know what, like you said, what a body looks like. Mm -hmm. You know, what these things that they're reading, I I used to love reading literature because while my mom censored all the kind of pop books that I read, anything (laughs) that was classic was fine. And I was like, oh, my goodness, what is this? What is happening? (laughs) I learned a lot of things from those books. Um, But yeah, we have to prepare our students to go into the world versus continuing to protect them into adulthood. Yeah, I mean, and I, I think I think if we if we consider what your average seventh or eighth grade student is going to see on a daily basis, 
um, just walking through the grocery store right. and, you know, past the magazines at the checkout, that to look at the David and talk about the idealized human figure and the fact that that is the human body is not intrinsically sexual mm-hmm. in, in this world that sexualizes everything right. is an incredibly important lesson. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And those kids missed it because classical education was supposed to be safe. Mm. And, you know, we, we recently had a similar thing happen to us. Um, we, we got banned from um, a education conference um, because this particular conference uh, asked if there was anything in our materials that would contradict their belief in young earth and literal six day creation. And we said no, because none of the materials that we were taking to this conference mm-hmm. had anything to do with origins. It just it just wasn't even an issue. Well, well, they originally accepted our our application to be at the conference and then retracted it because of things that I have written and things that another one of our authors who we weren't bringing his books either to have written that, you know, clearly weren't young earth six day literal creation. And here's the quote that I thought was so telling. We, I think this was in the letter rejecting us or withdrawing our invitation. I thank you for understanding why we must agree to disagree. I don't, but. And cannot expose our conservative Christian audience to well-trained mind resources. Wow. At this point, they're protecting not just students, but parents from I engaging know. with other ideas. The dangers of ideas. Not even the dangers of ideas, but it was as if it was as if we couldn't even be in the room Mm. with materials that had nothing to do with the ideas that they shouldn't. I mean, first of all, I disagree that they shouldn't be exposed to ideas that they don't agree with. But it was as if just our presence there, not even bringing a challenge to these ideas, Mm -hmm. was going to corrupt the parents. And oh my Mm. goodness, that is such an appalling take on what education should be. If your ideas are so weak that they can't even be in the presence of an opposing idea, what are you doing? Don't educate your kids at home. Mm. Send them out where they can be challenged because they're going to be frail adults. Right. And and the end goal, when you get to the rhetoric stage of a classical education, you are able to take your ideas, look at the arguments against it, and stand firm on what you believe by being able to use rhetoric to explain yourself, to explain your ideas, to debate with people. So really to believe something fully, you have to understand why you believe it, which oftentimes comes by looking at the counterpoints or the counter arguments. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, this just all goes to opposition makes you stronger. Right. Because you either have to articulate why you don't believe the opposing position and that makes you stronger, or you realize that actually your own position is not as strong as you thought Mm -hmm. and you need to rethink it and you need to come up with a better way of understanding the world. And that also makes you stronger. And that's such a big part of the classical tradition. Not my kids won't be exposed to anything upsetting or disturbing, but rather actually that's one of the things we are going to do on purpose. Right. To make them stronger. Right. I love that. Classical education is not safe. It is not safe. So does that leave us ready to recap our four negatives? Let us recap. All right. So to end this, let's restate all of these negatives as a positive and see what we learned about what classical education is. So we saw that classical education isn't just Latin. Classical education takes seriously the task of grappling with literature that forms and shapes you in your culture. It doesn't have to necessarily be Latin. It's all about the depth. Right, right. Getting deeply into another way of thinking or another culture's way of thinking. Classical education is not just for the super academic. Classical education is for all human beings. Absolutely. Classical education is not a specific program or curriculum. Classical education is the servant of the student, not a mold the student should be forced into. 100%. And classical education is not safe. Classical education is challenging. Oh, there's some very disturbing ideas in those classic authors once you get into them. Right. (laughs) Mothers and fathers beware, but not too much. Mothers and fathers. That's (laughs) right. All right. Well, so that's it for today. 
A thanks to you all for listening to The Well-Trained Mind. Please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And we'd love to hear from you, your thoughts on classical education, home education, school education, or any other kind of education that interests you. You can reach us at podcast at welltrainedmind.com. Thank you.